Welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and believe me, we have an awesome show for you today, uh, an area that we've talked about so much, and um, that New Orleans, uh, as usual, is at the top of the hit parade in this area, and we're talking about HIV, AIDS, and specifically today, we're talking about the No AIDS Task Force, and we have the CEO, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the No AIDS Task Force, uh, Mr. Noel Twilbeck. How are you doing, Mr. Twilbeck? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Oh, excited to have you, and believe me, we're honored to have you. Just to talk about it, and um, people, many people may not be familiar with No AIDS, but I don't think too many people aren't familiar with No AIDS because No AIDS is effective in the community. Tell us a little bit about the background. Well, No AIDS Task Force is the New Orleans AIDS Task Force. Uh, we're actually entering our 30th year of service into the community, providing uh, prevention and uh, HIV prevention and care for people living with HIV throughout the New Orleans and now Southeast Louisiana. Okay. Uh, so the organization provides a, uh, numerous services uh, around HIV prevention, and then we have also uh, primary medical care, supportive services, housing, and legal services specifically for those living with HIV and their family members. Okay, and when I think about No AIDS, you know, and we watch the No AIDS walk, huge, just huge walk. How many people y'all have out there? So. Uh, the walks, we usually have about 3,000 people that come out in support of, of the efforts of providing care and services for people living with HIV. Exactly, and so that's the point. When I think about No AIDS, um, as an organization, you guys seem to operate at like at the best practice level. The whole, as far as for treating a patient holistically and looking at um, their needs, it's a model that other people may want to model after your model, but well, how did it, tell us a little bit, what is it, how did it happen, okay. and uh, kind of where we're going. Well, well thank you first, that's, uh, that's very nice to hear. Um, I, I do think we have um, uh, uh, great services in all of our programs. There's always room for improvement, and that's one of the things we're continuously looking at. Okay. Um, the level, the, no, it's, as I, as I mentioned, in its 30th year of service, has had a long transition. It just didn't pop up overnight. Um, and when it did 30 years ago, it was nothing more than a uh, answering machine, I believe, in someone's living room. So this was back uh, at a time when people were getting sick, they were going into the hospital, they weren't coming out. Okay. And uh, as we started hearing more and more about, uh, at that time, I think it was called gay-related immune deficiency syndrome, um, uh, it, was, it was quite frightening. We didn't know where it was coming from. We didn't know what was causing people to become sick. Uh, so the agency, that, that, that was a, the start of the organization. We did find out that it was HIV, it was a virus. Uh, we did learn about how the virus was transmitted, how it wasn't transmitted. So in the early years, a lot of our focus was around prevention or at least telling people uh, it was awareness about how the virus is transmitted, how it's not transmitted. And then when the HIV antibody test became available, it was testing people or getting them uh, to, to understand and know their status. Um, a little later on, we started offering case management or the supportive services to uh, help people access care. And then we developed a, we had a, a part-time primary medical care clinic. It was mostly for people that were doing very well. Uh, we only had a physician that was there one half day a week at that time. Um, and that was pre-Katrina days. Um, after Katrina, uh, everything, everything was up in the air and, and we were just trying to figure out whether or not we could bring back the organization. We were concerned about funding, uh, federal funds, local funds, fundraising efforts. Um, finding staff, finding clients, just like many other organizations were doing. Um, but one of the things that we did at that point in time, um, all our staff came together and we said, you know, we, we knew there were a lot of things that were just not working right for our clients. So let's retool everything. Let's redo all of our programs and make sure that they were focused on getting people into primary medical care and keeping them there. So we did a lot of restructuring of some of our programs and, and, uh, and really, rather than offering a meal program where we brought meals to people. We continued to offer the program, but we wanted to also make sure that those people were also following up with medical care. It was great getting nutrition to people, but it wasn't enough to just get nutrition if they weren't accessing medical care and getting medications and staying on the medications and, and uh, learning and knowing that they had to stay on those medications for the rest of their lives so that they can keep their viral load down and their immune system functioning. So uh, Katrina caused us to, or the effects of Katrina caused us to retool a lot of our programs and really focus on 
primary medical care, getting people into primary medical care, and then using all the supportive services to assure that people continue to have access. Okay, good stuff now. What I think then is, I, I, let's take cancer, let's take diabetes, okay? Uh, n none of those diseases have the same level of holistic care, I think. And, and if somebody wants to debate it, we'll talk about that. But from my experiences, maybe for small pockets of patients, uh, but for the serve so many that you guys serve, um, what is it about your organization that's able to holistic look at, re do exactly what you said, retool the organization to really meet the needs of the patients and meals and everything else like that? Why couldn't that be done, say, for other diseases? Why is it not happening? You know. Well, I think it could be done. I think the model is um, is really it's a it's a model of care that's centered around the patient, centered around the individual, okay. and trying to develop those supportive services to get people into care and keep them into care. Um, and I think that's one of the um, 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 models that we're looking at, or, or nationally we're looking at, is a patient-centered medical home, where a person can come to a facility and get the the care and the wraparound services that will help keep them into care. Right. Um, I think in the with the epidemic around HIV and AIDS earlier on, we were just we were dealing with getting having people have the ability to die with dignity. And uh, we started programs that were more along the compassionate line of like buddy program to, to, to help a person deal with and process this um, uh, death sentence that they were getting at that point in time. As time went on, we, we learned a little bit more about the science and the medication and we had uh, drugs that uh, could move this, um, the, the, I guess the history of the, the disease to become more of a chronic medical um, uh, condition that if a person could access the appropriate medications and uh, that, that, that it's, a, it's a, still a chronic condition, but we have the tools now to better manage that. Um, it takes a, a lot of adjusting for the individual, though, because it's a life changer. The medications you're taking, you're not just going to take for three months. You're going to take for the rest of your life, and you're going to have to continually monitor what's happening with your body and whether or not your body is responding effectively to those medications. Um, there are also uh, co-infections that we may learn about or, or that um, there might be side effects and, we, and there might be other things we need to do to minimize those side effects, but it can be manageable for most people and it doesn't have to be and it's not necessarily a death sentence. Um, people still die, um, um, but, but quite often it might be, now we're hearing about um, uh, complications related to diabetes chronic heart disease, um, uh, uh, hepatitis, um, but, but we're, we're, we're learning better how to manage HIV itself, but we still have to look at the whole person and look at everything that's going on with that individual, not just their HIV care. Yeah, but see, that's just the point. And endocrinologists, you know, specialists with diabetes would salivate and say, if I had the level of wraparound care, that we had with HIV, then that patient wouldn't die of diabetes. That the, again, then they would have to pick another, there would be another disease, you know, or they end up having to be old age or something. I think, uh, I start wondering this, is it because um, you were over volunteers before you became CEO? We were talking I about was. that before, yes. okay, volunteer area. Is it because with HIV AIDS, we're able to generate a level of concern and care and bring in volunteers and um, uh, kind of esprit de corps, a kind of um, passion to help through the whole community that we don't have with, say, diabetes or something? Like somebody has diabetes, like, okay, no big deal. You know, you need to go eat right, get yourself together. And, but whereas um, uh, you see a whole different level of concern. I, I I, I can't give a definitive answer, but I can talk about what we're seeing in, in the HIV arena okay, great. with the organization. There's a level of passion with the staff that work there, with the volunteers that uh, contribute their time and efforts, right. uh, with those that support the agency financially that is, is incredible. Right. And uh, um, uh, people willing to roll up their sleeves and do what it takes to make right. an impact and improve health outcomes. Right. Um, I, I think that that's key to healthcare in general. I mean, we have incredible uh, medical providers that, that that's what they believe in. They're there to make an impact and improve health outcomes. Um, 
we have the luxury and the history in HIV that we've got 30 years of, of what worked, what didn't work, that, uh, that we're able to build on. But I think there's there, there some great, wonderfully uh, in, uh, helpful best practices that we could take and move to other disease states as well. Um, you know, passion, commitment, right. drive can go so far, and that relates to the individuals you're working with as well. Um, if an individual can see the passion that a volunteer has and, and their commitment to uh, reducing the spread of the transmission of HIV, it might give that individual a little bit more spark to say, maybe I can do something to impact what's happening in my community around HIV and maybe other STIs. So um, uh, that, that enthusiasm, that um, uh, charisma is, is kind of, it gets passed on. And um, I, I have the luxury of working in an organization where I see that on a regular basis, and that drives me, as well as many of our other staff. Yeah, but, uh, but that's just the point that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick on diabetes because it's an easy one to grab, I think. We can use high, high blood pressure, I mean, or whatever. If we had that level of passion throughout the whole team, people would take their medication. People would, you know what I mean, they would yeah. reduce, you know, uh, sugar, fat, salt, and grease. I mean, you know, if we, if we had that same passion, uh, to me it's, it's like it's chemistry, it's catching, it's something that just kind of grabs it. And that's why people go to the walk. Well, I think, yeah, people go to the walk for many other reasons, too. Sometimes yeah, it's yeah. To, mem to, to memorialize someone that they might have lost right. or be their supporter for someone who's struggling with HIV right. uh, themselves. Um, and uh, it's, it's actually just something fun to do as well. Uh, uh, it doesn't always have to be somber and, uh, yeah. and serious, but we can have fun with it okay. and, uh, and still be supportive of those in our community coping with HIV. Okay, question it. With AIDS trans moving from a... Uh, say an acute disease where, wow, somebody's about to die, somebody's about to die, you know, they find out they have AIDS, they might live for six months, and now, mm -hmm. again, we're dying of diabetes and everything else. Do you see that being able to continue that passion over the next, say, 10 years on this new phase of, phase of AIDS? We have to. Our community is being bombarded with the transmission of HIV, hepatitis, STIs. Um, we deserve better. Our, our fellow citizens, I, I'm one that believes that health care is a right. We, we, we should have the ability to, um, to take the technologies that we know about, about uh, our uh, medicine and, and, and health care, and, um, and, and everyone should have equal access to it. Um, but we, we, have to, we, have to, we have to do better. We have to do more. There's still, with HIV, we know enough about it that there's no reason, no good reason that any other person has to become infected. Got it. But it's very difficult to get people to change behavior. Okay. It's very difficult to get someone to say, if I engage in sexual activity, then I'm going to have uh, use barrier method availability every time. Just like it is for a person who has diabetes, it's very difficult to get them to change their eating behaviors. It's a lot easier to take a pill. But we have to do better with preventative medicine. We have to do better with educating our communities on better health, how to achieve better health outcomes that's driven from them, not necessarily just from the medical provider, but in partnership with the medical provider. Okay, watch this. Passion to care for one individual helps the individual care about their own life to not engage in high-risk behaviors. What do you think about that? In theory, sounds great, but no, it, it actually more, more than just theory. Okay, go ahead. Um, go ahead. In HIV, even even dealing with STIs um, or even other other uh, uh, medical issues, um, quite often we live in denial. Okay, you know, I right. I'm, I might know about my HIV infection, but if I don't think about it, I'm feeling good today. I don't need to worry about seeing a doctor. I don't need to worry about medications. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll worry about that later on if and when I get sick. Okay. But the education that I've heard from from my adherence counselor, the health educator, the nurse, right. Right. they right. tell me that I, I should be addressing this now so that I can stay healthy. Okay. Because we know what's happening with the immune system once a person has HIV wow. is HIV starts to spread. Right. And it starts to impact and, and uh, 
harm the immune system. Right. But I'm not going to feel it for quite some time. Right. What I know and what I feel, it's a lot easier for me to deny it. Okay. And um, I think that's where some of the passion for some of our health educators and volunteers and people that are working with individuals when they first find out about their HIV infection can be infectious as far as their enthusiasm. We have peer counselors who will work with individuals and well as well and say, you know, Chris, I'm not going to say I'm in your shoes, but I'm a person living with HIV too, and wow. I've been there before. Wow. And let me, let me tell you what happened with me. And I made a couple of mistakes along the way, but I learned how to do this, and now I'm taking my medications, and uh, my T cells have gone up. I have, no, uh, uh, I have a, an undetectable viral load. I've gone to the gym now, and guess what? Last week I started back at work after I've been uh, not working for three years because I've been too tired to get to work. So people can tell the stories of what's happened to them and help coach a person to, uh, to, to hopefully achieve better health outcomes for themselves. I'll bring it all the way closer. In medical school education, pharmacy school, nursing school education, uh, a big argument uh, nationally, how much do we include those types of courses for medical professionals to help them become uh, coaches and to help coach the coaches or whatever to in include that, meaning that that's so much part of health care. If you take that away, you know, do you really have health care? Yeah. I'm not a medical professional. I'm a business person. I'm an administrator. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but the so con you know, the concept. I, I think so. the concept is, um, is, is one that needs to be part of that, that curriculum in some fashion. Um, and even if it's not, though, there are people in the community that could, could, could help with that. Um, you know, we, medical providers get in the profession not because they just want to be the, 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 the doctor or the nurse. They get into it because they want to help right. their fellow human beings in some fashion. And right. re reconnecting with that passion is, is kind of what, the, what it's about. But even if not, the medical professionals can bring in peers, people yeah. that have uh, dealt with that particular medical condition and, uh, and, and help um, encourage an individual to work through the complexities that they might be having with what's going on medically, what's going on psychosocially, um, and, and all the impacts that that has with your family and uh, the dynamics that might happen if you're working or at school or uh, you know, so many other complicated things that sometimes get prioritized before our own individual health needs. You know, I love it because I'm, you know, holistic all day long. I love the whole concept because that's what it is. Uh, I mean, you guys have, what, 120 people, right? That's uh, at this office. Staff members? But, staff yeah. members. And how many are medical professionals out of that group? I mean, actually, say uh, doctors. Uh, probably uh, we have four, four, four practitioners and then about six nurses. A lot of them are, are uh, um, uh, case managers or behavioral health therapists, um, and then about 400 volunteers on top of that. See, but that's just the point. All of them are medical people because all of them are participating to keep somebody healthier. They're all part of the medical team, absolutely. Wow. Good uh, even those that are in, in our housing programs. I mean, exactly. their focus is, you know, if we can get if we can get someone stably housed, they have better opportunity to then focus on their health care needs. Oh, you made me feel better. That's why we talk about all this on health issues. We talk about housing, prison, everything. People say, what does that have to do with health care? Because that is the point. How can we talk about health care if somebody's living on the street? Right. You know. Yeah. I mean, if I if I'm 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 uh, struggling with two kids and, and worried about getting the clothes for school or the books needed for school or even uh, getting the rent paid, um, I'm probably not going to be so concerned about getting to my me next medical appointment right. until I can make sure that the, my family's taken care of or my more immediate needs if I'm hungry um, and I can, you know, I've got enough money to either get to the doctor or, uh, or even though it's, I know you know you'll hate to hear this, but maybe it's going over to the McDonald's. <laughs> if I'm hungry, I'm going to get something to eat with that right, right, you know, two dollars right. that I have. <laughs> right. um, but if we can address those needs and make sure that a person's not hungry, make sure that they, the food that they're getting is nutritious, that's going to help them metabolize the medications, the very complex medications they're taking, exactly. they're going to have much better health outcomes uh, if we can if we can assist in that in some fashion. True health care. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully we can achieve that in partnership with the individual. That's yes, right, because they're, they're kind of a part yeah. of the picture. We can have all these supportive things in place, and if the person is not going to access it, 
or gives up, then it's not going to do them any good. I'd much rather have those four or five hundred folk worried about me than to be all alone. <laughs> and some doctor that gives me an appointment six months later, you know, I have to go sit in the emergency room at university with 75 people in the emergency room and I have to wait 12 hours before I see somebody mm -hmm. that tells me they don't have time to deal with what I'm talking about. I'm looking at the differences. Well, sure. but this is the issue then. New Orleans is number four or five in the a, in a nation, HIV AIDS. Um, it, it, there are different categories. They, they, they count it as HIV cases, new cases, AIDS case rates, um, but we're, we're, we're up there in all, in all of those. We've got, um, um, I think we're number two in HIV case rates. Really? We're number four in AIDS case rates. Wow. Uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans goes wow. right there on the top. New AIDS cases, um, uh, in the South in general, uh, South, Southeast United States, we see a, a, a very high concentration of AIDS case rates. And uh, that's different than the number of cases. Okay. Case rates are based on the population. Okay. Um, so for a city our size, we have a much larger incidence of HIV than in other cities our size. Um, uh, that, that's, that's important because it's important to see where we direct our resources to combat HIV or for any epidemic we're looking at. Okay. Um, and, and then from there, we need to look at, okay, this is a virus. Where is the virus? How do we take our resources and really focus in on, on um, uh, finding the virus and then getting those people who have that virus into care? Okay. And that's, that's a challenge because we have many people who don't know their status. And if a person doesn't know their status, they could still be engaged in activity that could pass the virus on to another person. Okay. Now, a lot of the new science is telling us that if we can get our whole community and everyone that is living with HIV and we can get them on um, uh, highly active antiretroviral medications and suppress the viral load, then we will have a much better opportunity to slow down and thwart off the, the, the uh, spread or the transmission of HIV. Because if a person has a very low viral load, they're less likely to transmit the virus to another person. Okay. We want to take that a couple of steps further and say if that person is on medication, their viral load is lower, and we can educate them about how to reduce the risk of transmitting that virus to another person right. or becoming co-infected with another STI or a different strain of the virus for themselves, mm -hmm. then that person might be better off, our community might be better off. Okay. Well. So we need more resources, a bigger army. Usually we go to war, we need a bigger army, uh, more resources. Uh, where there's no reason for New Orleans to have to be number two, number three, number four, number five. I mean, we're, we're in bad shape everywhere we go. Uh, some of the factors that keep us at the high, late, high level. We're, 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 we're in the South. The South usually has higher poverty rates. We have other, we're, one of the highest areas in the nation with other STIs or sexual transmitted diseases, gonorrhea, chlamydia. Um, 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 I think for many people there's a distrust of the medical system as well, so people don't want to come in and get tested, or if they're tested, you know, we deal with the social stigma around HIV and AIDS and, and everything that goes along with it. Um, we've got to do better around prevention as well. We've got to get, it's not only just getting information out there about HIV and AIDS. Most people have heard about HIV and AIDS, right. but most people also think, I don't have to worry about that. That's those people over there right. or that group over there or the, uh, you right. know, the, the people on the other side of town. Right. We're all at risk for HIV. We're all at risk for other STIs. We're all at risk for hepatitis. Right. Um, we have a test, a very quick test that could tell us what our HIV status is. 10, 15 minutes. And if, if I am living, a person living with HIV, I can get into care and the disease can be managed and I could go on living a very productive or, or, or just as productive life as I could if I didn't have HIV. Right. So th there, we know so much today that we didn't know many years ago. I can remember back in the days when I was a volunteer director, I was responsible for our HIV counseling and testing program. Okay. And in the early days when the test came out, people would ask about the test. We didn't have a whole lot of, um, uh, of positive things to say about why a person should get tested. Because if they got tested, then they had the burden of knowing that they had HIV. 
but we didn't have a lot of tools to give them. We could offer them support. We can get them in a buddy program. We can, we can listen to them, have them process what that meant, but we didn't have the medicines to give them. We didn't have the arsenal of tools that we have today right. to keep that virus at bay, right. to reduce the, 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 vi the number of vir vir the number of viruses in the body and to keep right. our immune system functioning. Right. Today we do. Right. So it, it is so critical that, that uh, you know, we do want people to get tested. We want everybody to know the status so that if indeed they are infected, we can get them into care. Quick question before we close. We just have a couple of minutes. and. Uh, I've heard this concept of prison, the fact that Louisiana is the high, they incarcerate so many people and that relationship to the age rate. Is there any truth to that? I, I couldn't tell you, Chris. Uh, I, I, okay. think there's, um, I, I, I think there's so many other social determinants that are involved in there that, that, uh, that might also correlate that, okay. that it would be very difficult to pull out one and say, right. you know, one is, is more uh, uh, the cause of this and other things. Okay. We have high poverty. We have a high literacy rates. We, okay. um, you know, we have a high homicide rate. All those things correlate to a high HIV rate as well. We have okay. huge STI, uh, sexually disease right. rates. Um, I, we don't know. It's yeah. a great question. We okay. just don't know the answer. A lot more studies have to be done. Okay. I would prefer to take those resources and put them in the care and support. to <laughs> Do what we have to do and make yeah. it happen. Yeah. Um, about to close, just about, I think we have about 10 seconds. Just 10 second message, if you can just shoot it, what do you think that people need to know about HIV? Um, I think it's so important for us to know our, know our HIV status, um, uh, to be tested, um, to be aware of HIV, how the virus is transmitted, how it's not transmitted, and, um, and for those people living with HIV, to make sure we have access to care and uh, if there's anything we can do to help encourage that access to care, that's what we're about. Uh, for the general public who, who, who um, wants to know about, more about HIV, contact one of the AIDS service organizations in your community. Get involved. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, it's hard work. It's worthwhile. Thank you. Uh, Chris Sylvain with Health Issues. Uh, catch us on the web, healthissues2010.org. I think, but more importantly, uh, this is one area that we have to care about people. We have to fight as hard, we, as hard as we can to show that we care. Get information, get knowledge, be your best. Thank you so much. Great. Day.